we've seen in Isaiah 62 that the condition of the of the nation of Israel uh, or the condition of the uh, church we've seen what he did we've seen what Isaiah the prophet did he he set watchmen upon the wall he, he called them to non-stop prayer uh, he told them take no rest he, he would take no rest and then also to give God no rest until Jerusalem uh, had become a praise in the earth yeah, Isaiah he, I mean he sees the, com the coming captivity of the people and, and, and he says she's forsaken she's desolate uh, and I know when we look at these uh, scriptures, and I hope you'll see today what I'm talking about. When we use the word, she's forsaken, she's desolate, we say, well, that's not the condition of the church today. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Well, I hope to uh, bring your attention to a few things because what, what we've gotten into as far as the church, the church has, has become uh, quite arrogant uh, in, in, in many, many things. Uh, there, there's a uh, uh, a verse in, in Lamentations uh, maybe I, uh, this just kind of came to me uh, yeah Lamentations uh, chapter 1 verse 3 Judah is gone into captivity because of her affliction and because of great servitude She dwelleth among the heathen. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. Great servitude. You know what that means? Too busy. Too busy. Judah's gone into affliction because she's too busy. And, and you know, and I'm just throwing this out there. Uh, we, we live in a society today that most, uh, most people... Uh, raising a family, uh, both people work uh, because we say it. We need that, right? We need that in order to in order to keep up. I mean, oh my gosh! I mean, we've got all the modern stuff, and God help us if we don't have the modern stuff. And how many times do we break our backs trying to keep our kids in the modern stuff? So we work, 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 and then before long, we we've. We've neglected that that is important. So we come into great servitude. We, we come into bondage of the very, th the very luxury we were trying to provide. We've gone into captivity to it. Well, here is Israel gone into captivity. Uh, when they would go into captivity, they would be, they would be made slaves uh, to the to the other nations that had taken them over, and you know what? That's what we do. I mean, we become slaves to all the payments that we have, and payments to all the the debts that we've created. You know, I mean, I'm just I just want you to see this in light here, and not say, well, I thank God we're not back in that day. We still live in servitude. We still do. Still live in servitude. But, but, I mean, this is, this is what Isaiah the prophet has called them to do. He's called them to set watchmen on the wall and to pray. Pray without ceasing. Give God no rest. Take no rest. So, I, I want you to see this picture that we've got here in Isaiah 62 and Isaiah 63 of the, of the current condition of, of the church, the people living in the, in the UN, United States of America, in the church at this very moment. So I'm, I'm looking at this so that we can learn the lesson. So I, Isaiah, he exhorts the people to nonstop prayer. Last week we saw that how God gave him, uh, he gave him a vision of this man who comes up from eat him with dyed garments of Bozrah. He gives them this great vision. Uh, God does it to encourage his people so they won't faint and, and be overwhelmed. I mean, we, you know, you, he, he does this. I mean, the scripture talks about, I mean, there's a potential for you to faint here. 
there's a potential for you to be overwhelmed and swept away. And if it wasn't for God, you would be. So, so God gives revelation. Gives an encouragement. He gave them a glimpse of their glorious deliverance. I mean, you got to look. That's all they got was a glimpse of, of the glorious deliverance of his final victory. We, we see it. We, we see it in, in light of the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. So being encouraged, Isaiah continues to offer up his prayer. So that's, that's uh, where Isaiah 62 and 63 comes together. He's encouraging the people to pray here in Isaiah 62. He sees the, of what's going on and, and he calls them to prayer. Then he gets this encouragement we looked at last week from Isaiah 63, verses 1 through verse 6. And then in, with that encouragement, he continues his prayer. So, uh, and his prayer really goes from Isaiah chapter uh, 63 on to the end of, of that, uh, down to verse 19. So he continues his prayer in verse 7. And without reading all of this, we'll, we're going to look at some of it today and some more of it next week. This is good instructions on how to pray. The Bible makes it clear that we need instruction. I know in today's society, we don't think we need instruction. But I'm telling you, God is a God of order. And the Holy Spirit has all these scriptures, if you believe, are given by inspiration of God. The Holy, As many prayers as men have prayed, the Holy Spirit says, write this one down so that my people can look at it all the way up in our time and, and, and have some order into, into the prayer uh, that they're going to be praying. Uh, our government has said we don't need prayer anymore. They said enough with prayer. Time for action. Right? Have you heard that? That's what our government leaders have said. Enough with prayer. Time for action. We wonder why we're in captivity in the state uh, that we're in. Uh, we need instruction in prayer. Why do we need instruction in prayer? So the one, we don't indulge in vain repetition. Uh, and so that we don't fail to pray without understanding and without our heart. I mean, we've talked about that with understanding in our study in Hebrews. I mean, Full assurance of faith, full assurance of understanding, full assurance of hope, so that we pray with understanding. So always you'll find with these recorded prayers, there's a, there's a system here, an order. They're not just rambling prayers. and There's a definite arrangement and order. We want our prayers to be effectual, don't we? I mean, the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. How did these guys pray? So, I mean, if they prayed with, uh, uh, and their prayers were effectual, we should go look at how they prayed. Follow their example. It's very important to follow their example. It was given to us to follow their example. So here we have a prayer being offered by the prophet Isaiah and the people. Well, we could say today we have a prayer being offered by the church during a time of, of decline, right? It's going down. You know, I've seen the, the surveys. I'm sure you have too. More people now are leaving the church than in the last 20, 30 years. People are just leaving. I mean, look around. Where's everybody at? You know where everybody at? Everybody's got a camping spot down at the lake. Everybody's got them a boat and everything. I mean, really, they are. Because why? So I want to be entertained. The church doesn't entertain me anymore. I don't really have time for the Lord. And, you know, we've, well, I'll get to this point here in a few minutes. But, hey, you know, sleep in a lap of luxury. Yeah. So we have this prayer being offered here in the time of decline. And it's a, it's a great prayer for refreshing 
for it's a prayer for God to look upon his people once more. Now the first thing he does here in this prayer is remind himself of the character of God. And not only does he remind himself of the character of God, he reminds God of his own character. I mean, do you think about that? So he starts with the character of God. So uh, in Isaiah 63, and verse 7, uh, and we, we don't have that up on the screen because Morgan had to run out. So she's, she's not operating. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 7, I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness towards the house of Israel which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. He starts with the character of God. This is a secret of all true prayer. Prayer must always begin with the realization of God and His character. Even Jesus, how did Jesus tell us to pray? Yo, big guy, what's up? What did He say? Our Father. Where is He at? Who art in heaven? Then what did He say? Hallowed be thy name. We forget this a whole lot. And, and I, I mean, in our, you know, God spent uh, a long time with Israel showing them the proper approach to God. We see it in the high priest. And uh, we say, well, yeah, Jesus fulfilled all that. And, and now we come boldly to the throne of grace. But uh, again, I'll tell you, there, there's all involved. Work out your own salvation. How? With fear and trembling. There's, there's all involved here. The awesomeness of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, that is, that is gone away for the church. The wow of God, you know, the, uh, the whole duty of man. You all know what the whole duty of man is? It, it's in the Bible to fear God and to keep His commandments. Let me interpret that. To fear God, be in all of God and believe Him because that's the new commandment I give to you. So the whole duty of man is to be in awe of God and to believe in Him. That's the whole duty of man. That's it. Fear God. Keep His commandments. Whole duty. You want to talk about your duty? There you go. Be in awe of God. But in the church today, God is not, He's not, He's set before the people in awe. The gospel is not something great. It's what are you going to do for me? It's put me up on a pedestal. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Prayer must always begin with the realization of God, His holiness, His character, His righteousness, His awesomeness. Otherwise, it's, it's some psychological relief, you know. We... we Prayer becomes an expression of our fears. we we got to get a hold of these things. You know, uh, I mean, how many times in the Scriptures it says to be sober? What he's talking about, get your mind right. That's what he says. we got to settle some things down here. I mean, a lot of times we pray in our anxiety and all of this other stuff, but that ain't the way to do it. I'll show you. That's not the way to do it. We need to be settled, rooted, grounded. If prayer is to be real, we have to first realize to whom we are speaking to. Whom are we speaking to? We're speaking to God, our Father, the Creator of heaven and earth. And in order to have an intelligent conversation with somebody, listen to what I'm saying. In order to have an intelligent conversation, you have to know something about the person you're speaking to. Something about their background. Something about their knowledge. Something about the things they're interested in. You ever had to try to talk to somebody and they, their thoughts, are, they're not interested in what you're saying? You can't have a conversation, can you? 
But if I really want to talk to somebody and I really want to communicate to somebody, i got to find out what you're interested in. What is God interested in? He's interested in righteousness. Is he not? He's a righteous God. He's just. He's holy. He's good. He's interested in love. In loving kindnesses. So when I go to talk to him, I can talk to him because that's what he's interested in. And you ever talk to somebody who's interested in something and you say, well, they'll talk you at all. Because they're interested. They like it. They'll talk all day. I mean... You ever had somebody try to talk to you about something that you could care less about? Like how to install a catalytic converter on a new car? How long can I hold your attention? We'll talk to a mechanic about it now, man. He's in there all day. So you got to know something, what they're interested in. So the same goes in prayer. And prayer, I'll say this, you, you've heard it before. Prayer is our personal communion with God, our communion. You know what communion is when we gather around the table. Gather around the table. So we should remind ourselves of God's glorious character. Isaiah does that here. I mean, look at the, the plurals. He says, I will mention the loving kindnesses, the praises, great goodness, mercies. He mentions it again, the loving kindnesses. He's reminding himself how good God is. You know, sometimes we gotta, we got to clear the mechanism, clear the brain, and remind ourselves God is good. Now, the need here, we went over, the need here in this, in this prayer here is desperate. They seem to be abandoned. They seem to be forsaken. They seem to be desolate. Many had turned away. Many had, had took up the notion to start grumbling, start complaining. That was their, that was their lot. So the, the prophet here, he's got to make absolutely certain about God and his character. As if to say, whatever the present, the present situation is, whatever the circumstance it, it is, I know that God is full of mercies. I know that God is full of, of great goodness, loving kindnesses towards his house, towards his people. I know that is the, I, he's got to settle it in his mind that God is for you. You've got to settle that in your mind, don't you? Because sometimes we look at our situation and we think God is not really for us. You got to, if, if you're going to pray, you need to settle it right now or don't waste your time praying. God is for you. You need to settle that. His great goodness towards us. Where do you think Paul got his prayer at in Ephesians 1.19? So that the eyes that we sung the song, the eyes of your uh, hearts, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That you might see what is the greatness of God toward us who believe. The greatness of his power towards us who believe. That you might see that. I mean, that was Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1.19. I mean, if there's any doubt of that, it's, it's pointless to pray. I mean, uh, you know, you doubt and boldness don't go together. How do we come into the presence of God? With boldness. Not with doubting. Any man that, that doubts need not ask the Lord anything. I didn't make that up. That, that come from, from James. Doubting, halting, doubting, you know, halting, going back and forth. Is God for me? Is he against me? Is God for me? Is he against me? I mean, the Hebrews tell us we come boldly. How do we come boldly? Therefore, come boldly. How do we come boldly? How do we come with no, no doubt? Seeing that we have a high priest who's entered into heaven, even Jesus, Son of God. I mean, what, what boldness and confidence has he given us? We don't have to wonder about the character of God. We see it in the face of Jesus Christ. So we've got to clear our minds. We've got to settle it. God is good. God is for you. 
The goodness of God is great. I mean, look at how that says uh, in the middle of the verse back here in Isaiah 7. The great goodness. He just couldn't say the goodness of God. He's got to add the great goodness of God towards the house of Israel. Guess what? You're the house. Got to remind the character of God here. The great goodness of God towards us, his house, his people, that he's called by his own name. You know what Paul says? I told you we, uh, we have to settle our minds here. Because a lot of times we go to God and with, with our nervous prayers. You know what Paul says? In nothing be anxious. You know what that means? He's telling the people, okay, I know, I know, I know. And there are people who call you all the time, oh, oh gosh, the world's about to end. It's about to all fall apart. And you know what Paul says? Hang on, time out, slow down. In nothing be anxious. That, I mean, this is a good prayer I'm telling you about because how many times, myself included, have we prayed in nervous anxiety to God? I mean, here we are, we're, we're, we're in a mess. Oh God, if you don't save us. Paul says, hang on. In, in nothing be anxious. But what instructions does Paul give us? But in all things, with prayer and with the supplication and thanksgiving, let our requests be known unto God. Wow. So we can go into prayer with no anxiousness, no nervousness. Things settled in our minds. So the, how are we going to settle it? The first thing is to do is to remind ourselves of the loving kindnesses, the mercies, the great goodnesses of God. That's the thing. I mean, we, we battle with those things because, you know, you get tempted a whole lot. Does God even care? Where's he at? Where's he gone? You, and then you begin to doubt. You begin to doubt his promises. The first thing you got to do is got your mind right. Get your mind settled, clear and straight. Get rid of the doubt. How do you get rid of the doubt? Well, we see Jesus. I mean, you know, it's almost too simple. But we see Jesus. We don't yet see all things put under our feet, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. But we see Jesus. What do you mean we see Jesus? I'm going to tell you what. Uh, it is so important to have a good understanding of the Scriptures. I can't express that enough. You want you you want something you want a book to read? Get you a, a Bible and dive in, and and I and and pray before you read it and say, Lord, I want to see Jesus, and start reading, and man, it'll come alive to you, and and stay in there, stay in there. But we see Jesus. Isaiah. He, he, I mean, I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all the Lord hath bestowed on us. The great goodness towards the house of Israel which he bestowed on them according to his mercy, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. I mean, how did he bestow on them? Look how he says according. You know what according to? We've talked about that. According is, you know, when the elevator's going up and, it, and it's going to the seventh floor and it stops and the floors are even, you don't have to step up or step down. It's in accordance with, with it. So God gives according to his loving kindnesses, not according to what you deserve, thank God. He gives according to his character, Beth. He gives according to his mercy, not what we deserve. Think about that. He says, I'm going to remind myself how God gives according to his own character, which is loving kindness, which is mercy, which is great goodness. Oh, my God. So I've got, you see, now prayer starts to be with all things, with prayer and supplication and what? And thanksgiving, because when I start making mention and reminding myself, oh, my goodness, thanksgiving, it is, and, it, and, and then in that I let my request be made known unto him. 
And you know what? That's God's character. I don't know if you knew this or not, but it's eternal. Because God is eternal. He's immortal. He's, and His character changes not. That's his, it's everlasting. So everlastingly, He is the God of, God of love and kindness. He's the God of great goodness. <laughs> what, I mean, what can we do with this God? This is who He is. It's unchangeable. So whatever the situation, whatever the current situation of the church is, we got to draw this conclusion. Whatever the current situation of the church is, it's not due to the lack of loving kindnesses of God, our Heavenly Father. Would you agree? If God is good, if God is full of great goodness, He's full of, full of loving kindnesses, full of mercies, whatever the situation of the church, whatever the terrible situation she's in, it's not God's fault. Isn't that, isn't that one of the amazing things? You know, I always kind of tell when, when people, you know, uh, uh, come into maturity, really come into maturity. I'm not talking you got 18 and you can go vote. I'm talking really when you mature. And a lot of people go through the whole life and never mature. And you know how I always know real easy? Because it's never their fault. They never do anything wrong with isn't that what kids do? I wasn't me. I didn't do it. I don't know. A monster did it. You know, kids would just lie out of the blue. I didn't do it. I don't know. You know, people driving cars, kids driving cars, right? Well, they crowded me. They run me off the road. I mean, you know, why? You know, I mean, that's it's kids. It's what they do. It wasn't my fault. <coughs> wasn't my fault. And you know what the church, the church and their arrogance always said, it's not my fault. If we're really going to look at this situation and we're going to see the character of God, then we have to come to the conclusion this is not God's fault. The, 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 the things that are happening in our, in our country, in our nation, in our government, in our schools, in our homes is not God's fault. Because he's full of loving kindnesses and mercy and great goodness towards us. So we gotta we gotta make some adjustments here, right? And these things are recorded for our learning. And I will tell you this, if you if you feel that God is against you, I say stop praying immediately. Don't insult him. I know that may sound hard, but don't insult him. He's the God of great goodness and loving kindness, and it's not his fault. We start our prayer in worship. I've went over this so many times. What is worship? Worship is submitting. Sarah called Abraham her Lord. In other words, she took a proper place here. We start our prayer in worship, in, in submission, in, in, in adoring him, in praising him, into, into ascribing to him all the excellencies of his character, of his holy nature. All that he's revealed to us. How did he reveal them to us? In the, in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallowed be thy name. Then the prophet goes on to review the history of the children of Israel. He looks back upon, upon the history. Of Israel. And I, I want to tell you something. The prophets prayed this way. You can find this, this, this sort of prayer all through the scriptures. You'll find it in the psalmist, all through the psalmist. They are, they're in great need, great difficulty. And, and then there, there would be this remembering, this adoration. They would be looking back to the past. They would ask the questions, how do we get in this position? Uh, did it ever happen before? And they would always go back. I mean, we do this. Uh, they did a Passover year. What was it? It was to remind them how God delivered them in their current situation that was down in Israel. They did this all the time. People want to know what the, you know, Passover. Let's get it all exactly right. It was to remind them. Look at the character of your God, look at your situation, and look what in God's great deliverance. And here we are again, great bondage, the Pharaohs of Egypt are oppressing us, and all of this other stuff. 
And what could they do in there? All they did was cry out. So we, we can look in history. And there's great wisdom in looking back. I mean, when I look back and I say, aha, I've seen this before. I mean, I do it all the time. I look in scriptures and I say, wow. Just like in the time of Elijah, there's a God of Baal on every hill. Right now, there's not a statue on every hill, but my goodness, I mean, the, the, the Baal is coming to your homes and your phones and your TVs and your radios and every piece of media you got. Baal is coming in there, getting your attention, drawing you away. It's, it's, it's there. Drawing your kids away. It's there. Same thing. I mean, here we are. So what did we do? What did Elijah do? I could go back and look at the prayers that Elijah prayed. I could go back and look at the, the prayers that, that David prayed. I mean, David, he comes along. He's coming back. All the people's at Ziklag, he comes back. I mean, everything's gone. Everything's taken away. Wives gone. Everything's gone. And the people wanted to stone him. And here he is uh, off getting a, getting a, a victory and then, then this. So it's wisdom to go back and look. We have this long record called the scriptures of the history of God dealing with his people. Isn't it amazing? Now what's the one thing they want to do away with? They want to take history out. They want to take history out of the schools. Why is that? Because we can look back to history and, and learn our lessons, right? I mean, it, it's important to teach our kids what happened in, in history. It's, it's important to have heroes. I'm telling you it is. It's important to see what people did and not want to redo that again. And it's important. So what do we want to do? We want to rewrite everything. Get rid of all of that. Get rid of the history. And here God himself, through his Holy Spirit, has given us 6,000 years of history right here. 6,000 years worth of history. They want to do away with it. It's crazy. And I want to tell you, God doesn't merely give us teaching. He gives us history. He says what he's going to do with his people. He says what he's going to do for his people. And he's given us a record of what he has done for his people. So, so the prophet here, he looks back. Well, what is the relation of Israel to God? He looks back and says, well, uh, these are God's people. Let me, let me show you something. The, this is, um, um, go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to look at this. I won't read the whole thing. We'll start at verse 5. I just want to read you some verses here. We forget about this stuff sometimes. We forget about this stuff. Now this is, he, he brings them back to the story again. Now he's talking to Corinthians. He's not talking to, to, to the Jews here. He's talking to Gentile people. Corinthian, Corinthian church. Okay, what is he, he he's recounting the story of how God had brought them out of Egypt, brought them through the wilderness, through the Red Sea. The same things that we've been talking about in Hebrews. But but we know in the book of Hebrews they had a problem. They didn't believe. So here we are, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. Why was God not well pleased? I mean, I could go through this time, Tim, but without faith, it's impossible to believe God. So what was they're not pleasing in? They didn't believe God. What's the whole duty of man? Fear God and keep his commandments, which is what? Believe on him. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe he was good. So they were not, uh, many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So we're talking about God's people here, and they're overthrown in the wilderness. And he says, now these things, verse 6, were our examples to the intent, to the purpose, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. What were they lusting for? 
They're in the wilderness here. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe God was good. What did they lust for? It's been the whole point of Israel all the way down through time. She, she lusted after other gods. She went a whoring after other gods. She was an adulterous nation. She, she couldn't stay faithful to the, to the God who loved her. She went after other gods. You'll see this in a minute. Oh, he says it right here. Neither be you adulterers. This is what Paul is saying to the church. Don't be idolaters. As were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Wow. Now what does that sound like? Sounds like children, doesn't it? Same thing we saw in Hebrews. Babes. You're babes. Y'all not a he says, neither be ye idolaters. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. My goodness. Three and twenty thousand. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Do you remember? What were they doing to get, get destroyed by serpents? Why did God send the serpents? What was their great sin? They were complaining. They were murmuring and complaining. God sent snakes out there. And Paul, this apostle here, is warning you and me. I thought, I thought, now that we're in grace, we can do whatever we want. Isn't that what's being preached? Hey, it's okay. You want to marry a guy? Marry a guy. It's okay. You want to share bathrooms? It's okay. Everything is, you know, it's okay. It's all right. It's all good. We're in grace. You better wake up. You better wake up. There's a clear message of right and wrong. They were destroyed of serpents. Who sent the serpents? i got to ask you, who sent the serpents? Go read it in the Bible. You're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. God sent the serpents. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and you just agreed with me that his character doesn't change. And Paul is warning us, don't do that. They were destroyed. And then he says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Grumbling and complaining, grumbling and complaining. And then in verse 11, Now all these things happen to them for examples. You know what that means? For us to look back upon, to look back in the history and say, Aha! Before I want to start complaining, let me just wait a minute and stop it a minute and don't be anxious and let's just go see the character of God again. And okay, what well, just hang on a minute. Maybe the maybe the current situation I'm in is not God's fault. Maybe it's mine. Yeah. How am I going to get out of this current situation that I'm in? How did they get out of the current situation that they were in when God sent the serpent? Well, here's this crazy guy, Moses, takes a piece of brass and makes a snake out of it, hangs it upon a pole and sticks it up to the people and says, oh, that look on this will be healed. What kind of crazy notion is that? So there ain't nothing to hold up before the people except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's nothing else to preach. I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but the simple gospel truth. I got nothing else to give you but Jesus. So flee from idolatry. You don't need nothing else. You don't, you don't flee from that. You don't flee from fornication. You don't need nothing but Jesus. These things are written for our ammunition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Us, whom the ends of the world are come. And then, and then listen to what he says right here. He said, wherefore, because of that, here's a warning. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed. Be careful here, guys. I know we're in grace, and should we send more than grace, man, bound, God forbid. But let me tell you something, all you church people think you're walking around untouchable. Take heed. Any man thinks he stands, least he fall. Paul 
wrote this. The Apostle Paul. I didn't write it. Paul wrote it. Under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, okay, let me give you some encouragement. There hath no temptation taken you, but as such as common to man. You think this is something new? You think this is something, whoa, we've never seen this before. Oh, it's the end of the world, and we've never seen it. Oh, it's so bad, it's so bad. And the Paul says, now hang on a second. This has been going on since Cain picked up a rock and bashed old Abel's head all the way back in the garden. Man's been striving with himself, striving with other men, and striving with God. It's been going on. This ain't something new. This is common. Stop your complaining. Quit being anxious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then, then look what he says. But God is faithful. Do you get that? Yes, sir. God is faithful. What's that next verse? Next verse, Jeff. I think might have hung up on it. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be attempted above that you are able? But with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What was his way of escape? What is your way of escape? Same thing as it was all down through time. I'm going to put this cross with this serpent on it. And when you look at it, you be, what is your way of escape? Wait a minute. I've been crucified with Christ. Hang on a second. I've been raised to walk in newness of life. Hang on a second. We forget who we are. And then what's he say? Wherefore, because of this conclusion of verse 14, wherefore, look at this great admonition, this great warning, because of all of that, my dearly beloved, my people, my dearly beloved, beloved of God, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Get away from it. Get away quickly. You know what? These things coming on you. Do you see that? So we can go back and we can look at these scriptures and see. The church is in a terrible spot. Why? She brought it on herself. Brought it on herself. Let us learn the lesson. God is still the same. The principles of God dealing with His people never vary. What's the difference, you ask? Well, we're not under the law anymore. The difference now is covenant. You're dead and your life is healed with the Christ in God. What happens to, to the believers? We lose the joy of our salvation. We become anxious. We, we become upset. These were God's people that He said servants. There was God's people that He opened up the earth and swallowed them up when they went to argue with Moses and Aaron. It was God who did that. People say, well, God doesn't do that today. I'm telling you. Uh, we, we can have a long discussion on these things. God sets up kings. God brings down kings. God sets up nations and he brings down nations. It's the same God who still does that very thing today. God sets up churches some of them go by the wayside and they're just empty skeleton buildings now with nothing in them. What happened? Men repels against God. Men walks away. Men gets arrogant. I mean, there's a warning in the book of Revelation. Return. Return, he says again. Return to your what? first love. There's a warning. He says, at least I come and take the candlestick away. What is that? It's pretty tough, isn't it? I think I've known a few churches had their candlestick taken away. So here he is. Look at the lesson here. Why are we in this situation? I'm going to tell you why we're in this situation. The church became obsessed with itself. Became obsessed with the times. They failed to learn the lessons of history. Yet we have all this history, and to me it's a great comfort because I can look back and I can see that God is good and that He's full of great goodness and loving kindnesses and, and mercies. But many don't know the history. Many don't take the time to look at the history. And when you don't look at the history, what do you say? The end has come. I just read in Paul says, of whom the end of the age has come. See, they thought it too all the way back then. The end of the age has come. Oh, my God. I said, hey, this is just, this is not uncommon. These are just regular things. 
The many forget, and what are they? They're miserable, full of anxiety. They look around and say, well, this is the problem, that's the problem, this is the problem, like nobody's ever had a problem before, like this is the first time the church has ever been in trouble before. The antidote for all of this, again, as I say, we go back into the history of the church. There's nothing new about the present situation. It's only the form in which the situation presents itself. Many, many times in, in Scripture, even in our history for, for the last 2,000 years, the church has been in the depths of the bottom of the trough. Everybody thought the end was at hand. There's no way God could pull the church back out of this. Look at the corruption. Let's follow the history here as Isaiah does. Isaiah 63, verse 8, for he said, Surely... They are my people. What a, what a statement. Do you get a, get a hold of that? I mean, this is the prophet. He says, surely they are my people. Children that will not lie. So he was their savior. It frees up on you? Yeah. I got to ask, if, 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 if Israel is God's people... Let me ask you a question. How did they become God's people? Did they wake up one day and decide to be God's people and say, you know what, I think I'm going to be God's people. It didn't happen that way, did it? God went down to the land of the Chaldeans and he called a man by the name of Abraham. Abram he called. And he changed his name to Abraham. And that man began to seek a city whose builder and maker is God. God made them his people. God made you his people. Do you realize that? You didn't make yourself. He made you. You came into being through God's call. It was God's action. They are my people, sons. His people, his peculiar people. Not like the other nations because we're his people. And, and it says something here Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. And you think, well, why is that there? This is kind of King James English right here that's, that's confusing. Because did the children of Israel ever, ever lie? Oh, absolutely. Lied all the time. But what's he talking about? You remember when Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil? He was a liar from the beginning. He's making a distinction here saying that my people are not of the lie. They are born of the truth. They are of me and I am their Savior. It doesn't say so because they did this so I'll be their Savior. That word so in the King James was added. It's not supposed to be there. So, so it reads like this. For he said surely they are my people. Children that will not lie. He was their Savior. So we got to realize this about the church, don't we? The church is not a human uh, organization. It's not a it's not a club. It's not a social club. She's a new creation, born from above, born of water, born of the word, born of the blood. The church is the people of God, the city of the living God. She's the result of God's purpose, God's action. It's God who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have no being apart from God's, from our relation to God. Now listen to this in verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity. He redeemed them and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. You know what that really means? In all their affliction, he was afflicted. That's kind of a, a crazy translation, and all the commentaries will agree. It, it's not the correct translation. What it says is, in all their distress, he was no adversary. In other words, what it says is, God was never their enemy. I mean, think about that. God wasn't their enemy. 
I mean, how did he bring them? And the angel of his presence saved them. You know who the angel of his presence is? I'm just going to tell you, it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And what did he do? In his, how did he save them? In his love. God so loved the world in this manner. God so loved the world that he did what he gave. In his love and his pity, he what? Redeemed them and bare them and carried them. What did he do? He carried them just like he, he bore them on eagles' wings. The, the scripture says, bore them on eagles' wings. Carried them through the wilderness. He's the one that carried them to the Red Sea. I mean, go back to the history. They're in a tight spot. It, Egypt's behind them, ready to kill them. The Red Sea's in front of them. What's the prayer? What do we pray? How can we go forward? Moses, tell the people, tell my people, go forward. What are we going to do? What? I mean, Moses, are you crazy? The sea, it's big. God carried them. I, I love to go back and look at that. And I look at the tight situation of where we're at right now. And with great anticipation, I can see a Red Sea party. He brings them to the River Jordan. They're about to go into the Promised Land 40 years later. And what happened? They look at that river, and man, she's all swelled up. How in the world are we going to get across this? Our Promised Land is that. We're ready to believe you, God. And what did he say? As soon as the feet of the priest touched the river, it stood up in a heap. And again, they go around and they go through and dry shod. So much, it was so dry, he said, pick up some stones out of there and make a heap that when these other generations come and they'll ask, what mean these stones? Oh, then you'll have his testimony to tell him and go back. And I say, what mean these stones? Look at the early church and these people, just a handful. Just a handful of people, 11. Didn't they, they had Paul, there's 12. Everybody's against them. The Jews are against them. The, the, the Gentiles are against them. The authorities all against them. The whole world is against them. But look how God blessed them. Look how God carried them. Look how the angel of his presence, the power of the Holy Spirit was with them. These are they that have turned the world upside down. What are we going to do with these men? So that little group of people goes about conquering and triumphing and going forward. It's a little group of people. It looks like nothing. I mean, that's what it looked like when Jesus was dead on the cross. But we thought, that's what they said on the road to the uh, on, on the road to Emmaus. But we thought. I mean, do you guys ever look at church history? I mean, just uh, go back and look at the Protestant Reformation. Every one of us is here because of the Protestant Reformation. They, there was one church at the time, and it was a Catholic church under the under the under the headship of the Pope. And here's this guy, Martin Luther. Wasn't trying to break away from the church, but he stood against the... I'm telling you, the Pope had more power than any of the kings because all the kings of the world answered to the Pope. And he stood against it, threatened to be burned at the stake, had to go into hiding. You and I are here because of what Martin Luther, one man... Because he had a, a revelation that, that what? The just shall live by faith. I mean, what, do you see what these little bands of people can do? Little bands of people? I mean, here we are with so much against us, nations against us. Nobody wants... Uh, 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 to do anything with the church, here we are. We think, well, we need, we need, we need a thirty praying. We need fifty praying. We need a hundred praying. No, I see we're two or three. Ah, yeah. uh, it don't take many, does it? Not by might, not by power, but by my what? By my Holy Spirit, but by my Spirit. But God carried them all the days of old. But what happened to them? Look at verse 10. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. They grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy and fought against them. Although they had experienced God's goodness, they began to envy the other nations. They began to envy the, other, uh, the gods of the other nations. 
They began to feel like the religion of God was too narrow. Jesus even mentioned it, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. Few there be that find it because nobody wants the narrow way. We want the broad way. We want it easy. We want, oh, just give us what we want. They said it's too narrow. We can't live like we want. We can't eat what we want. We can't marry whom we want. They rebelled, turned to other gods. We like this other god. He's, he's a lot easier to follow. I hear so many people say, well, my pastor lets me wear this to church. That's the reason I go there. My pastor lets me do this. Hey, do whatever you want. Do you understand what I'm saying here? I mean, today, if you come up to somebody and culture that's called cancel culture and you will be canceled you do realize that you can't speak that that is wrong or you're cut off that's no uh, we can't do it. it's called cancel culture we don't want that God that he's too narrow why is the Christian church as she is today why are so many people leaving why do so few people even even care I mean, do you realize just a, a, I don't know how long he's in the middle 1800s, there was a guy named Charles Spurgeon. Yeah. You guys ever hear of Charles Spurgeon? Yes. I mean, when this guy preached, thousands showed up. It's the reason there's big churches around today. I mean, whatever, George Whitfield, one of these guys preached to 30,000 people standing in the field. Yes. When George Whitfield went to uh, Philadelphia, do you realize over half the city showed up to see him? Half of the city. Couldn't even get them in the meat houses. They had to do it out in the fields. He'd stand on a barrel and preach. He was he was early, him and him and the Wesleys, and then Charles Spurgeon came. And you know what Charles Spurgeon preached? Jesus Christ and him crucified. He didn't have no other elaborate programs, didn't have all these other things. He preached a simple gospel message. A message that people don't want to hear today. At that time, the church was in a dominant position. Even the politicians had to pay attention to her. She was rejoicing in the blessings of the God. Why are things so different today? Why does she seem so cast down, so carried away captive? It's what we've been, been looking about. What's gone wrong? The answer's still the same. It was the same in Isaiah's day. It's the same today. It's always because of her own rebellion. Her grieving of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we looked at Hebrews. What was it? They, they wouldn't believe. They wouldn't believe. They wouldn't go in. They wouldn't believe. The people today don't believe. Don't believe. Don't believe. Your own president is saying a prayer. We've had enough prayer. It's time for action. You know, we've waited on God long. You know what he's saying? You know what he's saying? We've waited on God long enough. And he ain't done nothing. So by God, we're going to do it ourselves. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. That's the nation we live in. That's where we're at. We're going to do it ourselves. Can't trust God anymore. He's a by word. We're going to do it. We have the power and the people gave us the power. But see, that's where we're at. There's just a few of us here gathered out with their eyes open. What do we do? We do what the promise says. Set ourselves to pray. Set watchmen on the wall. Don't give yourself any rest. Don't give God any rest. Churches rebelled. Rebelled. Notice the prophet didn't say the enemies have come and destroyed the church. No, no. He doesn't say that. You go all through the Bible over and over and over and you'll see whenever Israel is down and defeated, it's never because of the enemy. It's because she's rebelled against God. Always. Who can, who can stand against God's elect? No one. It's because of our own rebellion. It's not the enemy. It's not the government. It's not the state. It's not the laws. It's not the school boards. It's not any of that. It's our own rebellion. And what I want to call our attention to is our own rebellion. Every one of us. Do 
The church is trying to compete with the world. The church has rebelled, grieved its Holy Spirit. We've not believed Him. Turned from God and His revelation to other gods. What did He say? Flee from idolatry. They turned to their own notions, turned to their own ideas. They said, uh, they said God to the side. They turned to philosophy. What, what do I mean? That they rejected God's revelation. His revelation given to us in the face of Jesus Christ. And they put philosophy in His place. You know what philosophy is? It's a love of truth. And you think, well, that's a, that's a good thing. Philosophy is, is an activity where people undertake to understand fundamental truths about themselves. I looked this up. Under, understand fundamental truths about the world and their relationship to the world. The study of philosophy helps us to enhance our ability to solve problems. Oh, it sounds so great, doesn't it? It helps us achieve a state of goodness. Think about that. So people want to study philosophy when it's already been done. Already been done. You've already been justified. You know, what, you know what happens? I'm going to tell you something here, guys. You know, the scripture talks about they, they, they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. Let, let me go over here and, and, and get you something out of Titus. Uh, I've got to hurry here. Titus. Uh, where is Titus? It's in the Bible. Titus. Yeah. Chapter 1, verse 10. There are many unruly, vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, the Jews, whose mouths must be stopped. This is Paul speaking to Titus. He didn't say, hey, God, let's just all get along. He said their mouths needed to be stopped. Why? Because they subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, anything to make a buck. Right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm appalled at it, and it does. It makes me angry that a guy will get on TV and say, you know what? For $25, we will sell you this holy oil straight from the holy altar in Jerusalem, whatever. Plant a seed. Plant a seed, yeah. And whose mouths need to be shut. How are they going to be shut? One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Their witness is true. Wherefore, rebu rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Sometimes people, people need to be a little shaken. Right? Not giving heed to Jewish fables, commandments of men that turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, that's nothing pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable, disobedient, and every good work reprobate. Do you know in the book of Acts, and I know I'm really hard, in the book of Acts, these people went around, they just wanted to hear some new thing. You remember that? They just wanted to hear some new thing. And you know today, the, the old worn out message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified is just an old worn out message and people go to church and they're lined up because they want to hear some new thing, some new philosophy, some new book, some new thing. I will tell you, you might not believe this, but i got to tell you anyway. In my prayers the other day, the other day I, was, I was listening. You're not going to like this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The Lord told me when you hear these words, beware. Here's the words. The Lord is raising up a people. Doesn't that sound like the great title to every book that's going on right now? God's raising up a people. God's raising up a people. You know, I, I said, oh, Lord, you can't mean this. You can't mean this. I go, and I, I'm looking, and I see in the scriptures. And you know what? When the, when the riots went on, you know what Paul says? I didn't raise his people up. 
Because we all, and you know, you know what that does? That takes all the attention off of Jesus and his finished work and puts the people on the people he's raising up. Well, guess what? People, people said, well, God's raising up an army. When Jesus got up out of the tomb, the army was raised. Yes. A nation was born in one day. Let me just get that square right now. He ain't blown on bones no more. They're alive, and it's his body, and his body is the church. So stop it. He ain't raising up no people. He's done raised them up. I read where you've been raised up to walk in newness of life. So, so don't come and tell me God's raising up a people. I'm telling you, you're living in the old covenant. You need to come over into the new covenant. You need to see that it's already finished. But see, they don't sell books, does it? They don't, they don't give me no filthy lucre saying. They don't do no good for me and don't bring in the people. I want to hear what you're going to do for me, God. How are you going to make me proper, uh, pro, uh, popular? How are you going to make me prosperous? How are you going to set me up? How I'm going to evangelize the world? Let me tell you something. When, when the, his holy, the angel of his presence appear, his enemies are scattered. They're gone. It's set right in an instant. The, the prophet Isaiah didn't say, oh, God is raising up a people. He's, he's talking about the very person himself. He couldn't see him. He didn't know his name, but we do. And his name is Jesus. And we look back and we say, we see Jesus crowned with glory. Honor. Who wants to hear that? We don't want to hear that. I want to see you crowned with glory and honor. When I read in the Bible, when they're brought to the throne, every man takes his crown off and casts it at his feet because he's the only one. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This ain't a popular message. This is what, what made them want to stone Paul and put him in jail. People don't want to hear it today. God is raising up a people. When you hear that, beware. All the teaching, all the focus is upon you. Let me, let me, let me get it going. And I know I got all these pages, but I can, I can wrap this up. Let me get back over here. I'm just going to have to get to the point. Here, here's what he did. Here's what he did. In all of this situation, Isaiah, look at, look at, uh, look at verse 11. Then he remembered the prophet. He remembered. He remembered the days of old. He's calling this history back to his mind. He remembered the days of old. And his people saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? Do you see what he's doing? I mean, it's the prophet saying, Hey, guys, guess what? God's going to raise up a people and God's going to deliver them. No, he says, Where is he? Where, where is he? The days of old. Where is he when Moses was on? It looked like the people was never getting out of Egypt. They were never getting out. Where is he that appeared in the burning bush to Moses, the God of Moses? Where is he who led his people through the Red Sea? Where is he? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit in him? Where is he? I want, when is the church going to pray this prayer? Where is he? Where is he that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm? Dividing the water before him to make himself an everlasting name. That led them through the deep, a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So did they thy lead thy people to make a glorious name for himself. Do you, I mean, can you see this? People, people don't like this. Maybe I'll back up here a little bit next week. There's, there's a picture of the prodigal son here. The prodigal son in his arrogance said, I'll take my inheritance. Thank you very much. And what happened? He went on his way in his righteous living. And you know what? The love of the father let him go. And you know what the God in his love does to the church? He lets her go. And she goes out and she goes into the world and she lives all in a righteous living. But what happened? Soon the money's gone. Soon his friends are gone. Soon he's with the pigs and the pig mucks eating the husk. And famine was in the land and he's got nothing to eat. And that's where the church is, ain't it? There's a famine in the land. Famine for what? A famine for the word of God. She thinks she's getting fat and filled, but she's not.
You know what the prodigal said? The prodigal had to be brought to a place of the pig pen. The prodigal had to be brought to a place of, of starving, didn't he? I mean, he had to. God let him go. And he had to be brought to this place until he finally came to himself. Right? And I'm on the church. I'm ringing the bell saying, come to yourself. And you know what the, you know what the prodigal said? I will rise and go to my father. Oh, my God. This ain't God raised. I will rise and go to my father. And what does the prophet pray over here? Where is he? Where is he that giveth rest? Where is he that puts his Holy Spirit on? What did Paul say? Paul says, I counted all but dung that I might win Christ. I counted it all but loss that I might know him. There's nothing else matter until the church gets back in her mindset that nothing else matter. And her only cry is, where is he? She'll stay in that condition. Zion, filled with the praises of the Lord. No hope for the church until she's filled with this cry. Where is he? Do you remember Mary? What did Mary say when she came to the garden? Weeping. Angels there. She didn't pay no attention about the angels. She didn't care about no stinking angels. She didn't care about no disciples. She care about nothing. I want to know where my Lord is. I want to know where he is. I don't care if you're an angel. I don't care. Then if you're an angel, you ought to know. Where is he at? I want to know where my Lord is. I want to know where he's at. Tell me where he is. Tell me where you've laid his body. Tell me where he's at that I can go and find him. And you know what the church did in Isaiah's time? And what the church needs to do in this time? Set themselves to do none other than seek the Lord with all their heart. That's the answer, my friends. That's the answer. Nothing else but seek the Lord. With all our hearts. Where is he? Where is he? I'll quit with that. Amen.